Hello everyone, um, we are now ready to begin uh, the Moon Camp webinar with Easter astronauts Samantha Cristoforetti yeah. and Luca Palmitano uh, with the winning teams of this year's challenge. Um, I'll start by introducing myself. Um, I'm Dave and I'm part of ESA's education team um, and I work with space scientists and astronauts uh, to provide activities like the Moon Camp Challenge um, to schools across Europe. Um, also on the call we have Katia and Juliana from ESA Education who together coordinate the Moon Camp Challenge. So the Moon Camp Challenge was created um, and is run uh, in partnership with the Airbus Foundation and Autodesk. Uh, so first of all, before we get any further, congratulations to all of you um, for being selected as one of the 12 best teams out of almost 250. Uh, the incredible work you have put in to create your lunar bases was evident uh, to ourselves and the judges, and we are all extremely impressed with your submissions. Um, all of the entries were judged based on their creativity, feasibility, uh, the quality of the 3D model, um, and the adaptability of the design to the lunar environment. And your submissions did well in all of these categories. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a quick introduction to Samantha now, uh, so you know a bit about her. Um, she will be joining us shortly, and then Luca Parmitano will um, uh, join us a bit later to answer your questions. So, um, like you, they are connecting from different locations. Okay, Samantha is in Europe, but Luca Parmitano is in the USA. Uh, both were selected as ESA astronauts in 2009 and graduated from astronaut basic training in November uh, 2010. Uh, Samantha was then assigned the role of ESA reserve astronaut. Uh, which allowed her to maintain and, in, and uh, gain her qualifications in uh, robotics and extravehicular activities, as well as the certification as the flight engineer on the Russian Soyuz spacecraft. In March of 2012, she was then assigned to fly as a flight engineer on the Soyuz TMA-15M spacecraft as part of Expedition 42 and 43 to the International Space Station. Um, and then on 23rd of November, Samantha was launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome uh, and then she returned to Earth on the 11th of June 2015 after spending 200 days in space. Uh, Samantha is not only passionate about science and technology, uh, she also has an equal interest in humanities. And furthermore, she has spent some time in her spare time. Uh, she's an avid reader. She enjoys learning foreign languages. Uh, she likes to do sports, uh, hiking, skiing, yoga. Um, and she's been very passionate about education um, and has inspired thousands of school students across Europe during her time in space. And uh, she recorded several educational videos uh, while on the ISS and even supported a school experiment using spirulina, which is a type of seaweed, if I remember correctly. Um, so uh, a bit about Luca as well. Uh, so after graduating as an astronaut, Luca was assigned in February 2011 as a flight engineer of the Italian space agency for his first long duration mission on the uh, International Space Station. Uh, launched on a Soyuz from Baikonur Cosmodrome on the 28th of May 2013 uh, during his Volare mission. Lucas spent 166 days in space and personally conducted um, over 20 experiments. He took part in two spacewalks, one of which was the famous EVA 23, a spacewalk where his life was at risk. Uh, and there's a documentary about that which you can find online. Um, and the docking, he took part in the docking and berthing of four spacecraft as well, and he landed safely back on Earth on the 11th of November uh, 2013. Um, and Luca was also launched to the International Space Station for his second mission on the Russian Soyuz MS-13 spacecraft on the 20th of July 2019, which coincides with the 50th anniversary of the first human lunar landing and then returned to Earth on the 6th of February this year. And his 201 day mission um, saw him take the role of the International Space Station Commander 
for Expedition 61, <coughs> becoming the third European and first ever Italian to command the International Space Station. Uh, so Luca and Samantha together hold the record for the first and second longest spaceflight for a European astronaut. Um, Luca also conducted a series of complex spacewalks uh, during the Beyond mission uh, to repair the cosmic particle hunting alpha magnetic spectrometer instrument, also known as AMS-02. Uh, he has now conducted six spacewalks in his career, uh, totaling 33 hours and nine minutes. And then during beyond a uh, lose 50 European experiments and 200 international experiments in space. Um, another highlight for Luca is that he performed the first ever live DJ session in Earth orbit and has logged a total of 366 days in space and more than any uh, Easter astronaut. Uh, in history. So uh, Luca enjoys doing lots of sports in his free time, uh, weightlifting, swimming, biking, running, snowboarding, scuba diving, and he likes reading, listening to music, uh, and of course spending a lot of time with his wife and two daughters. Um, and he has supported several school projects in the past, such as Astro Pi, Mission Space Lab, and he has also been the ambassador for Missions, Mission X. Hi Samantha, thanks very much for joining this uh, Moon Camp webinar. Uh, I'll just pass um, the floor to you for some opening remarks. Wonderful, all right. So hello again, let's give it another try. <laughs> so it's uh, very, very happy and honored to be here, to, to meet you guys virtually. It's, uh, it's great to see so many bright, brilliant, dedicated, engaged, boys and girls from around the world, literally. I mean, that, that's, that's really cool. Um, and you guys decided to dedicate your talent and energy and passion and curiosity to the challenge of exploring the moon. That's, of course, very dear to me as an astronaut. So congratulations for, for your achievements. And uh, maybe I'm looking at future colleagues of mine or Maybe I will be retired one day and, you know, doing something else or hanging out on the couch and, and looking at you guys doing amazing things in, in space. So very happy to be here and ready to answer your questions. Okay, thank you, Samantha. Right, so Team Voya, we're going to unmute your microphone. Team Voya, please go ahead with your question. Uh, the audio was quite choppy there. I'll just repeat the question. Um, what would you? What would be your first sentence if you would be the first European and the first woman walking on the moon? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question. I I think I would struggle with that. I um, I would have to think about it for a long time. You know, days, weeks, months. So I I don't really have an answer for you right now at, at the same time you know i'm wondering would it really have to be my sentence i mean the, does it really have to be so personalized um you know when, when you happen to be the first person doing something it's not always and not necessarily like your achievement it doesn't mean that you are like the best or something like that you know it, it just sometimes it's just about being in the right place at the right time. And and most of the time is not your achievement, is the achievement of many, many people. And that's especially so in, in space exploration. So maybe we should move a little bit away from personalizing things too much. And I'm not saying that the Apollo astronauts did that in any way, but I maybe I would pick somebody else's words or, you know, discuss it with a wider group and then it wouldn't just be my own words. It would be more significant, you know, for, for all humanity in a way. I think that would be my dream. <laughs> Great. Thank you for that. So um, the next team is uh, Apis Melephora. Uh, we will now unmute your microphone and 
to please go ahead with your question. Hello from France. We are Gemma, Younes, and Simona Leroy, the Apis Medifewa Moon Corp. Our question is what a training will an astronaut have to do before living and working on the moon? Right, so that's an interesting question as well. Um, so when you when you train for a space mission, and I think it's in a way it's it's the same whether you're going to space station or maybe maybe to Gateway one day, which will fly around the moon or on the surface of the moon, or maybe one day on Mars. Um, there's a number of things that you need to be able to do. Um, so let's start with the most simple ones. You need you need to be able to exist to live, to function as a human being. You know, you just continue being a woman or a man, uh, you know, when you when you fly to space and you have very much the same needs, right? Like you, you have to eat and drink and use the toilet and sleep and, you know, and, 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 and move around and, and things like that. So um, those are like, you know, the, the basic functions that, you know, how you, you have to know how to perform. Uh, and they're a little bit different, of course, than, than they are in your home. So you would have to understand how is this habitat on the moon built that you're going to live in and how you can do all those things so you can keep functioning as a human being. The other thing that you need to be able to do is to keep your spaceship or your moon base functioning, right? You know, just like here on Earth, you know, you know, we have most of us, uh, unfortunately not everybody, but most of us have a home, you know, with with uh, you know with solid walls and uh, and and running water and electricity and a toilet and all of that, and um, you know, if something breaks, some things maybe we can fix on our own, and if not, then we can call a technician, a specialist, and he or she will will fix it for us. Well, in in space or on the moon, the astronauts, of course, are on their own. So we really need to be able to fix things that might break in our moon home. You know, and of course, we, we can always phone for support, right? We can call by radio, the specialists and the smart people on Earth, and they can help us out figuring out how to do things. But then physically, you need to be able to do those things. So those are the basic things that you need to be able to do in order to then do all the cool stuff that you went to the moon for, right? You know, to go and out and do spacewalks, you know, on the on the on the surface of the moon, and and go and pick interesting rocks and do science and geology, um, and test new technologies, and you know, do experiments, set up experiments outside, do experiments inside. So you have to learn to do all those uh, all those things as well. And then you have to plan for a bad day. And that we do a lot in astronaut training. I mean, a lot of what we do in training is trying to be ready for that bad day that we hope doesn't come. Uh, and so how you deal with emergencies. What do you do if a fire breaks out? What do you do if you have a so-called depressurization event when, when you have all the air in your habitat flowing out? Uh, what do you do if you have a medical emergency, if somebody has a trauma, an accident, or gets ill for some reason and, you know, you, you, you have to take care of them? What do you do if you have to evacuate in a rush? All of those things we train a lot for, although we really hope that that training is never going to be needed. <laughs> Great, thank you, Samantha. Okay, so we'll go to the next team now, um, which is Team Lunar Empire. We will unmute your microphone. Uh, please go ahead with your question. Hello, we're Team Lunar Empire. This is Kyle Wu. I'm a fifth grader. And I'm Harrison. We're both from Michigan, and our question is, how does it feel to be in space? Did, did you get used to the weightlessness? Yes, hello, thanks for this question. So I loved weightlessness and I did get used to it. Um, it. It does take a little bit of time 
it, it was not the case for me. I was lucky, but for some astronauts, it, it really takes a, a little bit of time physically, like maybe a day or two or a few more days um, in, you know, in which they don't feel very well. Maybe they have nausea, kind of like some people on, on Earth feel sick in, in the car or on a boat or on an airplane. Uh, there is also this thing called space sickness or more correctly space adaptation syndrome. And about half of the astronauts have that. And uh, as I said, I was lucky. I didn't, I, I felt really well up there from the very beginning. And, uh, and I had this, this magnificent feeling of really enjoying being able to float, right? You know, all of a sudden you can fly and you can move around and go up on the ceiling and then bounce back and do somersaults and all of those things. Um, at the same time, it does take, uh, you know, I'd say at least a couple of weeks until you're really comfortable uh, moving your body in a somewhat um, coordinated, gracious way. So what, what happens at the beginning is that you will typically use too much force when you're pushing yourself off because you, you just can't really understand at the beginning how little force is needed. And then maybe you push off in a way that actually not only makes you move where you're trying to go, but it also makes you tumble, which actually you didn't want. <laughs> um, and so you, you get a little bit out of control. Um, and then maybe you're not going to aim correctly and you're going to hit something that you didn't intend to. Um, and then maybe you're going to lose things at the beginning because you're just not used to the fact that you cannot, you know, let things you know, stand somewhere, you know, they, 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 unless you secure them one way or another, they, they will float away and then you will lose them and you will have to go and hunt for them in, in the space station. So I'd say it takes a couple of weeks until you are um, comfortable and efficient uh, moving in this weightless environment. And then as time goes by, you become more and more and more um, efficient until probably about a couple of months into your flight, you've reached your peak of, of comfort uh, dealing with this uh, strange situation. Um, but, but overall, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a great feeling. I think all astronauts love weightlessness and we tend to, to miss it a lot when we come back, just as a physical feeling. <laughs> Great, thank you, Samantha. Okay, so we're going to go to the next team, um, which is uh, Team Crescent Dwellers. We will now unmute, un unmute your microphone. Uh, please proceed with your question. Okay, I'll ask the question for them now. Um, the question is, can you describe your path since you went to university until your first mission in space? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I went, uh, so when I went to university, I wanted to study engineering, which is, uh, is what I did. Um, so for a couple of years, I studied generically uh, mechanical engineering, and, and then I started to specialize in, uh, in aerospace. I did a lot of aerospace propulsion and lightweight structures. Um, and, and at the same time, I really wanted to um, it's the opportunity of, of going to university to make it also a, let's say, a cultural experience. So I'm, I'm Italian, I grew up in Italy, I went to school in Italy, but when the time came to go to university, I chose to, to go to Germany or actually come to Germany because that's where I live today. Um, and so I studied aerospace engineering at the Technical University of Munich, and, and I was really into, again, um, experiencing different cultures and learning sure. different um, languages and, and seeing time, different I'm ways really of doing to, to the, um, the opportunity. Uh, and so I, I, um, I really sought out opportunities to live in different uh, countries. So I, you know, I spent um, four months in, in France as part of my university study. And so I studied aerospace engineering. A whole uh, um, year, almost a year in, in Moscow during, during my thesis. But then at, at, at the same time, I was always passionate about flying and very curious. Well, uh, curious, I'd say, because I had never had the opportunity of, of doing a flying license, but I um, I was always attracted by this idea of becoming a pilot and specifically a, a military pilot. And so after I graduated, 
I actually applied for the Air Force Academy in Italy, <clears throat> which is a little bit of a strange path. Uh, it, it was only possible for a short time, and it was also a little bit strange because I basically started from scratch again with an undergraduate um, university course at the Air Force Academy. Um, but yeah, but I, I was really um, curious about uh, being trained as a military pilot. So I, I, you know, I did the academy for a few years, and then I was uh, I was trained as a combat pilot. And uh, you know, that that's several years of training and several steps until you actually get to fly a combat aircraft. Um, and just about at the same time, ESA, the European Space Agency, announced that they were looking for new astronauts. And uh, of course, I applied. Um, on, on the one hand, I was giving up my military pilot career, um, but at the same time, it would not have been a good idea to wait for the next round because the next round hasn't happened yet. <laughs> I'll probably do a next round of selection in a year or two, probably a year. Um, and so I guess I, I, I did the right, you know, I made the right choice. I applied and I was lucky enough to be, to be selected and I've been with ESA since then, it's been almost uh, or over 10 years now. And I did my basic training, that's about 15 weeks, uh, together with five other uh, Europeans that were selected with me. Um, and then a couple, yeah, I guess a year and a half later, I was assigned to my uh, first space flight on the International Space Station. And I did quite, quite uh, a long training time. I mean, I, I trained for about three years. Um, both because it was my first space flight, so I had to do all my qualifications. Um, and also back then we, we flew the Soyuz, which will probably not be the case next time. And that requires a lot of training as a flight engineer. You know, I, I flew as a Soyuz flight engineer, which is sort of like a co-pilot. And that requires a very extensive training in Russia. Great, thanks, Samantha. Okay, so we'll move on to the next team, um, who are ACR Explorers. Uh, we will unmute your microphone and please proceed with your question. Okay, I will ask the question for them. Uh, the question is, if you had the chance to travel inside a black hole, would you do this? What do you think would happen to you there? <laughs> um... You know, I'm not an expert on black holes, but I don't think that's a very safe thing to do. <laughs> so I would probably immediately die. Um, so no, I don't think I would travel into a black hole, no. Okay. Right, okay. So um, the next team is uh, Project Sequana. We will unmute you and please go ahead with your question. Hello, we are project, Team Project Sequana from the UK and our question is what are the ESA's plans for future moon exploration and what is the ESA's contribution to the International Lunar Gateway project? Yes, thank you. Thank you for, for the question. I mean, there's, uh, it's, it's an exciting time right now. We are really um, getting ready, but you know, like practically, you know, do, do doing some, some very exciting work about finally uh, going back beyond low Earth orbit. We haven't done that for, for a long time since before I was born and certainly you. Um, and um, and it's this time it's a truly international endeavor. Uh, and so from from European side, we will play a significant role in this um, uh, what's being called the Artemis program, or let's call it the Artemis Gateway program. Um, the astronauts will fly to uh, cislunar space, so to, to the space around the moon, let's say, on a spaceship which is called Orion. And the European Space Agency is providing the service module of Orion. Basically, you know, Orion is, is, is made of two parts. There is like a part which has this typical conical shape and that's the pressurized part where the astronauts travel and live uh, for the duration of the transit. Um, and then it has like a cylindrical part which is a service module and um, the service module is really essential. You cannot go anywhere without it. You know, it has the main engine, it has the solar panels, it stocks the consumables, it manages power distribution, thermal control. 
So it's very, very, very important and essential. Um, so we, we, we provide basically an essential part uh, of this spaceship that will bring astronauts to cis lunar space. And then, of course, I think you mentioned the gateway in your question. The gateway is this small space station. I mean, not as big as the International Space Station, uh, much smaller, um, but much further out in orbit around the moon. And uh, we will start building it probably with the first launch in 2023. Um, and a few years later, uh, well, and, and even that, that launch already will have a significant European contribution in terms of the um, high performing communication system. Um, but then a few years later, IHAB will come the International Habitat, which will be the main habitation module of Gateway. So it will provide um, a place for the astronauts to um, sleep and eat and, and live and, and do and do work. Um, and a little bit after that, there will be another module called, called Esprit which will provide a refueling capability now uh, because the, the spaceship will have uh, um, engines both chemical engines and electrical engines and will it be able and that's that's part of the things that we want to demonstrate in deep space you know the, being able to relocate itself from you know different in different orbits in around uh, the moon and Esprit will refuel those engines so that we can do a lot more of those maneuvers for a much longer time and it will Hopefully, I mean, we, that's the baseline right now, and we astronauts are really rooting for it. Um, it will also have like 360 degrees viewing windows, and uh, astronauts really like windows, but I think also, you know, the, the people really like to see pictures that astronauts take from the windows. So I think we're all hoping that we will have many big windows. Thank you. Um, okay, so team to go is uh, we will unmute you uh, and please go ahead with your question hi 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 my name is Iris uh, this is Davis and our teacher uh, Edgars we are six squad team from Latvia Sigulda uh, our question is uh, what experiments have you done on the ISS that uh, could help build a lunar base and what is the main difference uh, technologies, uh, experience, uh, obstacles, etc., uh, between doing experiments on the ISS and back on Earth? Right, so thank you for the question. So on ISS, we do um, a lot of science experiments on the human body in, uh, in the space environment, so that extremely important because we need to understand what, what happens to our body and to our health as we live in space for longer and longer times. So that's, of course, very important for uh, exploration beyond LEO, uh, <clears throat> around the moon, on the moon, and, and even further out towards Mars. But there's also a lot of uh, technology demonstrations, you know, like uh, uh, validate in, on the National Space Station technologies that can then be used for, uh, for example, lunar exploration. There's a lot of um, work on uh, life support systems, on advanced life support systems, on radiation protections, but even things like uh, 3D printing. You know, when I was when I was up there, we had the very first uh, space 3D printer. It was a relatively simple um, polymeric extrusion printer. Um, in the meantime, they have um, a more advanced one, and then ESA is as well for, for metal, um, so that pretty really exciting technology that will definitely be useful also for, for more exploration. The team uh, Moffel and Optiman, um, we will unmute you, uh, go ahead with your question. Resources on the moon are limited. Do you think that in the future lunar exploration uh, should focus on scientific or commercial commercial exploration? So, Were you able to... um, that's an interesting question. I don't know if I understand it correctly. I mean, I, I think commercial exploration, what you mean by that is to go and find resources on the moon that you can like mine for profit. And then that's Probably what you mean. I'm going to assume that that's what you mean. Um, you know, 
I think that's just for different types of actors to uh, to pursue, right? I, I, I think probably space agencies uh, shall and will continue to focus on uh, scientific um, research and technological development and demonstrations. Uh, but of course, there's a synergy. Uh, we will definitely have uh, as space agencies, we will have to um, do a lot of prospecting of, of seeing exactly what kind of resources are available on the moon that we can use to build sustainable habitation and um, emissions. And all that knowledge, of course, will be available and, you know, it, uh, can, uh, um, uh, pursue a business model, uh, they can certainly do it. I, I think there's a there's a number of legal aspects that need to be clarified, though I don't think they have been about, uh, you know, who, who owns uh, potentially um, resources found on the moon. I don't think that there is a consensus on that. So that would definitely have to be clarified. There would have to be a common framework, some kind of international agreement that before um, commercial endeavors of that kind can be pursued. Um, you know, but, but there's other ways. I mean, certainly there's a room for tourism. I don't know, maybe uh, providing services for, for agencies like communication services. This is something we're pursuing from ESA side, by the way, with a private public partner. So um, there's there's a lot. I think there's space for everything, and different actors have different priorities and different roles, and that's that's the way it should be. Great, thank you, Samantha. Okay, so um, let's move on to the next team, which is uh, Team Sosa. Uh, we will unmute you. Please go ahead. Yeah. My name is Philip, and I'm part of SOSA team from Slovakia. And I would like to ask what type of degree increases your chances of going to space? And does the prestige of the university even matter? <laughs> wow, those are very career oriented questions. <laughs> um, well, to your second question, no, I don't, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think there's any evaluation made on the prestige of uh, the university. Um, and not even a degree uh, or a class of degrees that will uh, better position you to become an astronaut. Um, at, at least for now, we, we, we do require that you have some kind of science, engineering, or math or medicine degree. So, um, you know, if you, if you have a passion for fine arts, then you, you can pursue that as well, of course, and we love it, but that would have to be on top of your um, scientific engineering, medical or mathematical um, degree. Um, and we definitely like people who maybe can bring some kind of operational experience. Um, that's, of course, a given for people coming from the military or from aviation me, but you know, if you if you pursue more like a scientific engineering career, it, it's good to see that you've done something, um, you know, in in some peculiar environment. Like you know, my my colleague Alex Gerrist um, spent time in Antarctica before he became an astronaut. My other colleague um, Andy Mogensen um, spent time on oil platforms. So those are just examples of colleagues who did not come from an aviation or, and or military background, but had a strong uh, personal history showing that they can they can operate and, and thrive in in uh, in environments that need a little bit of uh, operational mindset. Operational mindset is you know thinking about procedures, communication protocols, safety, you know risks, and 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 all of those uh, all of those things. So I think those are more important than you know having a specific degree or coming from a specific university. Great, thanks again, Samantha. Okay, so uh, the next team is uh, Team MVP. Uh, we will unmute you. Please proceed with your question. Hello. Hello. Hello, and from Germany. Many thanks for this great, 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 great,
QMG. Uh, I'm here with my Moon Camp Challenge partner, Vincent Pfeiffer. My name is Peter Krull. We are the Moon Camp Challenge team of the Edelstein Schule in Darmstadt, Germany. This is our question for Samantha. How did you deal with the isolation from your family and friends during your stay on the ISS? And how do you deal with isolation today? Many thanks, Samantha. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I have to say I did not feel isolated. Um, so I guess, you know, the, there is an objective aspect, you know, the fact that you, okay, objectively are isolated in, in the space station, but then uh, it's a lot about the way you feel. I mean, do, do you really feel disconnected? Do you really feel isolated? And I have to say I did not. Um, first of all, you're not alone up there. You're with uh, with uh, a crew, and I think as long as you get along in in your crew and you know you have a good relationship, then you know you, you, you that gives you a measure of connection that is very important. Um, we are also very much involved with the teams on the ground. You know, we, we, we talk with them all the time. We didn't, you know, it would be very different going to Mars because there is no real time communication, but. On the ISS, communication is almost real time. The delay is very small, and so you you really feel like you're a part of this greater team of of people supporting you and guiding you in many cases from from the ground. And then you have many many opportunities to be in touch with your family and friends. You know you can call them. There is like a voice over IP system, kind of like a, you know making Skype calls. You know there's no video, but you can call them um, once. Uh, per week on the weekend, you, you you have an actual video call where you where you can actually see each other um, for a little bit. Um, so I you know I, I had many many opportunities and ways not to feel isolated and uh, and I think it was the same during this uh, um, yeah strange time that we have uh, um, behind us uh, in the past few months. Um, you know, the, the, the opportunities for connection were, were still there. So I, I, I felt quite connected. Great, thank you, Samantha. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna to go to the next team, which is uh, Team Cams Nova. We will unmute your microphone. Uh, please proceed with your question. Hi, I'm from Cams Nova in the US. And our first question is, what were the things about living in space that surprised you the most? So yeah, thanks for the question. I, I, I did not feel surprised a lot. And uh, I think the reason is that I am not the type of person that depicts the future in greater detail. I kind of like to let things happen. Um, and so I, I don't have that strong comparison. You know, I, don't, I didn't have strong expectations of how everything would be. And so I didn't have that reaction of, of saying, oh, well, that, that's actually different than I thought. Um, you know, many things I just knew because in, in training, of course, you learn so many things that uh, in the end you don't get uh, surprised. But but many details that you then get trained about, I, I didn't worry. Um, and, and people are different. I mean, there's other astronauts I, I, I remember during training, they kept asking all these detailed questions uh, uh, to, you know, astronauts who came back from space. And I was more like, well, you know, I'll get to space when I get to space and I will, you know, let things come at me and, and see how it is. And I enjoyed it like that. In hindsight, you know, one thing that, you know, you, you can really be surprised about is how adaptable we, we all are, you know, how easy it was to feel at home up there, you know, to, it, it became very quickly my new normal. Um, I, I remember after maybe a month or so, not, not much longer, thinking that I didn't really remember how it felt to walk or to sleep in a bed, you know, that sensation of weight on your feet or weight on your back if you're lying down. I could not recreate that sensation in, in my mind, uh, although I had <laughs> spent all my life walking, right? Um, but my new normal was floating and I, I uh, it was difficult to imagine. Yeah. Sorry, Samantha, please go ahead. Oh, yeah, then I, yeah, I was just going to leave it at that. I think we have some a couple of more questions. So. <laughs> okay, so thank you again. Uh, so this is the last question. Uh, so um, Team Moon Camp 8, we will unmute you. 
Please go ahead with your question. Okay, this is Team Eight, and we are from China. My name is Tsai Han Yu. Uh, my name is Wang Chutai. Our question is: Being an astronaut is such a great profession. Could you please share your story story with us? And what made you want to be an astronaut? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for the question. <laughs> So I, I say sometimes that I did not choose space, space chose me um, because I, I always wanted to be an astronaut since I was very young, uh, you know, since I was a child and maybe it's a time in your life where it's, you're, you're not really making conscious decisions yet, you know, you're not really rationally thinking about uh, the choices you will make, but you know, you just you feel this attraction, this interest, this passion for something and somehow for whatever reason you decide that this is what you want to do in, in life and it becomes your dream and your passion. Um, and it does not happen to everybody and that's fine too, but uh, yeah, it, it, it happened to me. So I, I always, always knew that I, I wanted to fly to space one day. And, and then I guess what happened is that growing up and then I started to develop this more mature interest, you know, grown up interest, um, they were compatible, they were the right things, you know, I became very much interested in science and in technology, or maybe there was a, you know, an influence, maybe it was also because of my dream and then that, that you know, that it took me to, to take a specific interest in science and technology, but it kind of all came together. And then my passion for flying. So, you know, I, I, I became, you know, older and older and, and, and I realized more and more than this childhood dream of mine of becoming an astronaut was really the right thing for me because, it, you know, if I managed to become an astronaut, it would bring together all of those interests and passion for science, for technology, for flying, but also for languages, you know, for um, different cultures, because you know, we live in a very, we live and work in, in space business in a very, very multicultural, multi-language environment. So, it, you know, it, it was just perfect. It was making it all work out for me. Um, and, and that's why I think I, I stayed on that path and I was enough to, uh, to fulfill that dream. Great, thank you, Samantha. That was the last question. Um, so um, uh, I'll just uh, give the floor to you if you want to give any closing remarks before you leave. Yes, well, thank you for, for all your questions. I think we, we covered uh, many, many different topics, you know, from from dreams and a personal path and education to, you know, building habitats on the moon and, and, and technologies for that and, and science and the uh, exciting projects that we have going on for, for the next uh, uh, years to come. So, you know, I, I, I hope that we in the space business right now, we are, we are going to be able to lay uh, good groundwork for for your guys's generation to to pick up and uh, I wish you all the best in the pursuit of your passions and and your dreams and again congratulations for for your achievements on this uh, on this moon challenge great thank you so much Samantha so um, we've had Luca on the call for um, a few moments already uh, Luca do you hear me okay I'd like to say hello to Samantha. I haven't seen her in a little bit in a while, and it was great to hear her voice. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So, Luca, do you want to make any um, opening remarks to the students? Well, um, first of all, congratulations for being here. You have been uh, selected because you uh, you are uh, you did a fantastic job and uh, you deserved. Um, uh, a prize and so I'm very curious very excited to hear your questions and hopefully I'll be able to give you uh, interesting interesting answers which is always the hardest part okay 
Okay, thanks, Luca. Okay, so we're going to get started with the first question then. So, uh, Team Voya, uh, we will unmute you. Uh, please proceed. First question for Luca. Hello, my name is Vojta from the Czech Republic. Uh, Luca, we know you had a problem during your space one in 2013 and you almost drowned. How did you manage to stay calm in this situation? Were you afraid of your next space hold during your mission beyond? Have you discussed this experience with other astronauts who had a similar experience? Wow, good questions and uh, it's really three questions in, in one. So the first answer, um, how did I stay calm? Well, there's, there's really, I always said there is really no merit because it really depends on your training. What, what you do in, when you are in an operational environment, and I heard Samantha talking a little bit about what it is an operational environment. It means managing uh, contingencies or emergencies and nobody is born with that capability, but you, it's something you can learn and you learn it by training. I always say that fear is lack of knowledge. We, f we fear what we don't know. So in this case, um, I had the experience of knowing my spacesuit, knowing the space station, having trained quite a bit. And so my reaction was determined by the fact that I, I didn't panic because I, I had in my mind a clear path of what I wanted to do and how to solve the problem. Rather than focusing on the problem, I focused on the solution and that focus gave me a direction on what to do. That's the, so the answer to the first question is you remain calm by, by having knowledge, by training. So in your case, uh, I would say that you, you young students uh, should take this opportunity uh, while you are growing up and learning to learn as much as you can, because the more you know, the less you will fear. And the less you fear, the less you have chances to go into panic. Uh, as for the second answer, no, I didn't have any, any fear of going out again. As a matter of fact, uh, I was ready to go outside earlier than my second mission. I, I wanted to go out as soon as possible and finish the job. Of course, once we understood that we, we had a problem with the suit that we needed to solve, uh, I couldn't go out again during Mission Volare in 2013. But uh, of course, uh, on, on the second mission, seven years later, I, again, I was ready. I knew that the problem had been solved. And um, I was very, very excited to perform my, uh, my new EVAs. And uh, um, I was very confident that the suit would behave uh, the second time. And as for the third question, did I share the experience? Of course, that is uh, absolutely of the utmost important to share the experience so that, uh, first of all, we can take action and solve the problem at, at a physical level, but also take different action to create new procedures, to create new understanding so that nobody will have to run in the same problem, into the same problem that I ran in. Great, thanks, Luca. Okay, so we're going to go to the next question from Team APIS. We will unmute you. Uh, please go ahead with your question. Good evening from France. We are Gemma, Younes, and Simona Leroy, the APIS, the APIS Medifera Moon Camp. Mm -hmm. Our question is if you had the capability to travel anywhere in space, which planet would you like to visit? Uh, bonsoir, mes amis. Uh, C'est un, un très grand plaisir de parler avec vous. So, um, I am an explorer at heart. So, um, if I if I could go anywhere, I would go to to a place that it that it hasn't, hasn't been seen at all, something completely new, something, something that we don't know anything about. And I would like to have the chance to learn as possible about that planet. Now, I know that visiting a extrasolar planet in my life is going to be impossible. It really is in the realm of possible. I cannot even dream about that. So 
I will answer also in, a, in, a, in another way, and I will say that what I would like to explore right now is our planet, planet Earth. There are so many things on our planet that are unknown, that are haven't been explored. The bottom of the ocean, the inside of uh, cave systems underground that haven't seen the light in millions of years. So uh, I think I would have the dream of the impossible visiting a different planet, uh, but uh, on, on our solar system, I, what I really want to explore is our planet, the underground or the bottom of the oceans. Okay, thank well, you so much. Um, I think Dave, he um, is disconnected. So I will give the word for the next question to Team Luna Empire. Okay. Hello, we are Team Lunar Empire, and our question is, what type of experiments did you do on the moon? So, wow, I wish I had a whole day to talk about this, the science on the space station, because at any time, we run between 200 and 300 experiments. So I don't have a whole, I don't know, I don't have enough time to talk about all of my experiments, but uh, these are, uh, I can tell you that we have science that ranges from biology to physiology to science, material science to uh, earth observation, uh, fluid physics, uh, combustion, chemistry, you name it, we are probably doing something on the space station concerning it. Uh, some of the interesting experiments that cannot be done anywhere else but on the space station are uh, concerning the human body. And I think those are interesting because we can explore parts of our body that that are hard to explore on the ground. For example, we learn uh, by being in a, in a, a microgravity weightlessness environment, we learn how to, uh, how our, our balance system works, how our eyes and body sensors work together uh, in, in, to, to let us understand how our three-dimensional three world uh, surrounds us and how we interface with it. So uh, th those are th those are some of the experiments that we do on the space station that are really, really unique. The combustion that I was talking about, those are interesting because flames work differently in orbit than they do on the ground um, it, uh, because of the microgravity uh, and the the inconsistency of uh, density. The flame doesn't have the typical uh, shape, but it's more uh, of, a, of a sphere, so things burn differently in orbit, and so we study that. Uh, other things that we do, we study the behavior of, of animals and, uh, and how they react to microgravity. So all very, very, very interesting observations that can only be done in orbit, but really, we uh, we do all kinds of different experiments, and um, uh, it would really take me a lot of time to talk about all of them. Um, just to conclude, and just to give you another idea of stuff that we can do on the space station that cannot be done in orbit, when we grow things on orbit, either a protein or a crystal, it's not affected by gravity, so it comes out in a perfect three-dimensional shape without being affected by the vector of gravity on the ground. So those are other things that we do in orbit that cannot be done on the ground. And by growing a specific protein or a crystal in orbit and make it perfect, it's more it's more similar to what happens in our body. Uh, so it, these are very important advancement in technology or medicine uh, in the future. So uh, again, uh, I hope I hope that maybe a picture interest and you can look it up on our websites at ESA or NASA to go see what kind of science we do in orbit. Thanks, Luca. Um, I had a bit of technical difficulty there, so uh, apologies for that. Um, but we'll go to the next question now, um, which is from Team Colors. Uh, we'll unmute you. Um, please proceed with your question. Uh, hello, we're the, the Crescent Dwellers team. Uh, we're from the Lycée Francais Charles Le Pierre uh, in Portugal. Um, I'm Lucas Costa and she's Mathilde Ayou. And our question, our question is, what did you do for Earth? 
Did you continue training for future missions or did you specialize in a different field? Question. So I actually just came back from space uh, months ago and um, oh, an astronaut uh, is an astronaut it's only about five to ten percent of his life, um, of his professional life. The, the rest of the time we spend it on the ground. So we do train a lot and we continue training. Uh, but um, when, when we come back, we actually usually assume support roles and everybody does a little bit of different things. So personally, um, uh, my support role when I came back the first time, I became the lead astronaut here on this here in Houston, in JSC, where I'm living, where I'm currently living, and my job was to to help my other classmates fly into space uh, by being a Capcom, so a communicator, being a trainer uh, as an instructor astronaut. Uh, I had um, uh, I was a ground IV, the person that talks to the astronauts in orbit to let them do their spacewalks. Um, and then when I was assigned, I started training for my next mission. Now that I come back, I'm actually going to be the chief of the support office. So I will help my, I actually am in charge of the communicators, all the people that talk to the astronauts and also the, what I call the BMEs, those that take care of the medical uh, side of their permanence in orbit. I also, um, help uh, design procedure and um, review all the experiments that go in orbit to make sure that they are appropriate to uh, be in orbit. So a bunch of different things. We usually don't specialize, we just get assigned to different jobs. For example, Samantha has been working with Gateway for the past few years and um, uh, I will be in this job for two, three years and then maybe I'll switch to a different position. And then hopefully I will start training again. I will continue uh, training because as a matter of fact, as an instructor astronaut for robotics or EVA, I also have to keep myself updated on, the, on that capability. So I continue performing training uh, underwater uh, or robotics operations so that I can help my colleague qualify for their flights. So those are, those are all jobs that astronauts do when they come back to ground. Okay, so the next team is um, SA Explorers. Uh, we will unmute you. Oh. Please go. Your question. Okay. So, Hello, I'm Arash, the head of ASEA Explorer team. They are my teammates, Ashia, Pahom, and Ali. We are members of Iranian Aerospace Explorer Academy. Our question is. In the future, we will need to produce artificial gravity for space travel, for example, a rotation ring, a shaped spaceship. Is this possible? And if yes, how? Well, um, it is. It is certain. It is engineering problem. Uh, it it is possible to stay in space for a very long time. Uh, and uh, preventing uh, damage to the body by exercise. So uh, we have we have extensive experience nowadays, about 20 years experience with um, m machines uh, that we can use constantly to keep our body in good shape. And um, uh, so we, we call those countermeasure devices in order to keep our body in good shape. Um, obviously, uh, a centrifuge, a rotating uh, part, would be a good countermeasure. Uh, it, probably a combination of that and exercise would be the best solution, best engineering solution for uh, deep space, um, deep space exploration. But yes, it is absolutely feasible. It's just a matter of uh, engineering. Great, thanks, Luca. Okay, so the next team is um, Project Sequoia. Unfortunately, you guys started me about 15 minutes late. Uh, I can give you another uh, five, maybe 10 minutes, so we, we're gonna have to go fast, unfortunately. Um, I, I was counting on finishing by uh, in, on time, but I'll give you extra time, but unfortunately, I have another another meeting. Okay, okay. Sequana. Thank you, Luca. Um, okay, so Project Sequana, please go ahead with your question. Hello, we are Project 
Kwana from the UK, and our question is, from your experience of sustained habitation in space, what would you find important in a moon base? Um, well, it, this is a highly hypothetical question. So a moon base and a space station are, are, will, would be very dif different, but there are a couple of items that uh, learn from my experiences in orbit that would be valuable. First of all, uh, currently it takes a very long time for us to be able to go on a spacewalk, to go into vacuum. So um, I would say that uh, having an environment that lets us... It looks like I got kicked out. You guys still there? We're still here, loud and clear. Oh, okay. Somehow I got kicked out. So what I was saying is that um, I would want something that lets me get in and out of the base uh, in a fairly quick way. I would definitely want windows to be able to look outside, even even if there is very little. It's it's such a um, a, a, a human a human thing uh, to to be able to to look outside and have sunlight, uh, natural things. And then I would definitely want. Um, uh, exercise room so that I could keep uh, my body in good shape while I'm in orbit, uh, on the, while, while I'm on the moon, even on the surface, since it's only one sixth of the gravity, and um, uh, at, at also a possibility to have a communal life because I was certainly not, I would want to be able to spend time with other crew members. So uh, those are some of the elements that I would really think are indispensable in the future for a moon base. Okay, so the next team is Sig Squad. Uh, please go ahead with your question. Uh, hi, my name is Davis, and we are the Sig Squad team from Latvia. And our question is: uh, In space, human life is certainly fragile thing because there are so many uh, things that could can go wrong uh, and in, impact our life. Uh, what are your thoughts on how could we explore our space further beyond our solar system while maintaining uh, safety and staying healthy? Well, uh, first of all, I think uh, life is fragile everywhere uh, in, in general, not just in space. So I would uh, uh, I would not be too worried uh, about uh, it, it's life is fragile and resilient at the same time. So we have uh, taken steps in making sure that we are protected um, by if you want a very futuristic approach to this idea, maybe we need to evolve into something different. Uh, and what I mean by that is that it is not unthinkable to intervene on the human uh, DNA to make a different kind of human. Uh, right now we are the Homo sapiens, but if our approach to, uh, to science and exploration and ethic, ethical approach um, changes, we can imagine intervening on the human DNA to, to make humans that are more uh, resilient to space flight, that are more adapted to space flight. And what uh, if you read in the, if you read sci-fi, science fiction, you can imagine uh, a, a kind of traveling, space traveling humans that, for example, have a, a tail, like monkeys, a prehensile tail, because I can guarantee you that in orbit it would be really useful to have a tail to hold on to things and also uh, change the feet so that they look more like hands, again, like monkeys, because feet are not very useful in, in space, but hands are. So if I could have four hands and one tail, I'd be a better human. And at the same time, uh, if I could uh, um, make uh, a human DNA that is more, uh, more resistant to radiation, uh, then uh, evolution would just, would just uh, lead me in that direction. But other than that, those are, again, those are very, very futuristic, uh, probably impossible point of view. The biggest thing uh, that we need to do when we think about human exploration and protecting is engineering. Uh, it will be the responsibility of the engineers of the future to build, to build machines, spacecraft that are shielded uh, by, uh, that, that are shielded from the cosmic rays and also for long, long exploration that these machines, these spacecraft, will have to be self-repairing because a lot of the crew will be in cryogenic sh uh, sleep. They will be unable to have support 
even if they're awake. So the machines will have to be self-repairing. Again, it's an engineering and technological feat uh, that, we, that we have to think about. Thank you, Luca. Okay, so the next team is uh, Mofalin Optiman. Uh, please go ahead with your question. Is mental yes. health a uh, concern when sending astronauts to space? It all depends on how you select the astronauts. If you select them mentally uh, healthy, then you then it shouldn't be a problem. I mean, um, we have been going to space for uh, up to a year uh, in a very constrained environment, the space station. And uh, even if you send them away uh, to Mars for a very, very long mission of two years, um, mental health would not be to me a concern because as long as you select them, uh, you know, motivated and and healthy, then uh, it, it's just another aspect of life. Uh, people that people that are selected into this job are they they want to go to space and they that about it and they understand uh, what it takes and. Uh, and the difficulties and the fact that you will be uh, in a way isolated for long periods of time so it all depends it really depends on the on the selection system plus plus we really have uh our, we can provide a lot of good support uh, so that to, to lower the level of stress what you see in movies sometimes about astronauts going insane and becoming crazy and uh, and uh, want you know wanting to open up the airlock and go outside that's it makes for a good story and it makes for a good movie but uh, we it's it's not reality it's not what happens happens uh, for real in orbit uh, the it, it's really it's part of our selection process uh, to to choose people that are that are mentally stable and uh, you know, and they can live, live and thrive in such environments. Again, being an astronaut is, is made up of people that volunteer to do it. They want to do it. They want to go exploring. They want to go in space. So uh, certainly mental health is part of the selection process and part of the supporting process. Great, great answer. Uh, so I have, uh, uh, I have a, time for maybe one more, one more question because I really need to go. I'm late for my okay. next event. Okay, thank you so much uh, for staying longer. Uh, Team Sosa, uh, we will unmute you. Please go ahead with your question. This will be the last Okay, question. hello. My name is Daniel Dvornichenko. I'm the manager of uh, Sosa team from Slovak. And my question is, how will commercial flights to the International Space Station affect the workflow and organization of the tasks for astronauts? Ah, uh, well, for the, I don't think there is going to be much of a change because we only have, um, we only have so many things that we can do at the same time on the space station. You know, um, even when we will have um, uh, two toilets and uh, uh, and more capability to support astronauts, the space station is really built for only uh, six or seven people at the same time, uh, and. Um, uh, and so even with the flow of more astronauts, what's going to change is just uh, people will be trained to uh, to do the, all kinds of different jobs. And maybe there, there will be a couple of people that are specialized. But in general, there's, there's only so much that we can organize on the space station. So I don't, I don't think it's going to be a much of a change. The, the biggest difference that I can imagine is that there will be more people traveling. So there will be more up and downs and shorter missions rather than 200 days or, or 300 days like we've been seeing in the past couple of years, I would see smaller, smaller missions with astronauts that just keep doing uh, the job organized the way it's been done so far. They are, they are calling me from, from, the, other, from the other debriefing. I'm really, I really apologize. Uh, I, unfortunately, my, my schedule is really, really tight. It was such, such a huge pleasure to see your faces. I'm, I was really excited to do this. I see your smiling faces, and it makes me think that uh, the future, the, the future is going to be good because I see a lot of, lot of bright people. I see you guys over there wearing your smart jackets and your, and uh, uh, I, I can imagine that thanks to you people, you are the future. The future it really is in your hands, and it makes me think that uh, thanks, thanks to you, there is, there is a lot of hope. Um, and I don't know, I'm looking at you guys and uh, I tell myself, 
maybe I'm looking at one of the people that will land on Mars one day. So I really want to look really, really give a good look at your faces because I may be staring at the astronauts of the future. So uh, good luck, uh, keep rocking, keep loving what you do and doing what you love. And uh, I hope to talk to you soon and maybe one day, who knows, I will be teaching you how to go to Mars. Thank you so much, Luca. All the best. Okay, folks. So, um, uh, what I will try and do. Uh, so, we've had we've got a few. We, there are three teams that didn't get to ask their question. MVP, Cam's Nova, and Team Moon campaign. I'll um, I'll I'll write uh, Luca an email um, and ask him to uh, uh, give us a written answer, which will forward forward to you on email. Okay. Uh, apologies for the for the overrun of the time as well. So um, just to wrap things up then, um, currently uh, astronauts um, only work on the International Space Station, um, but soon they will be going further into the solar system, um, further to the moon and beyond. Um, ESA along with uh, space agencies around the world are planning on going to the moon. And the first stage of this will be the, uh, the previously mentioned Lunar Gateway. Um, this will be a space station much smaller than the ISS um, that will stay close to the moon. Um, and from this station, human robotic missions um, will be able to travel to the moon and further out into the solar system. And it will provide shelter and a place to stock up on supplies for astronauts en route to more distant destinations. And uh, space agencies around the world are also investigating how humanity could set up a base on the surface of the moon. Um, I believe it will be called the International Moon Base. And this is what you have been doing. And I'm sure all of you realize that this is not a simple task. And there are many challenges um, to building a lunar base. So we hope that you uh, have enjoyed taking part in the Moon Camp Challenge this year. And we'll continue working hard at school. And who knows, as Luca said, maybe one day uh, you will be astronauts or the lunar architects of the future. So uh, thank you very much for joining today and I, and I wish you a very pleasant rest of the day.